Good afternoon, brethren. It sure really is a joy to be with all of you. I know um, last year when we first met, we have uh, we were able to see the, your faith and, and the love that you have for one another, and we have longed to see you um, ever since then. So it, it really is um, an honor to be with you and an honor to testify before you today. Uh, when considering what Christ has accomplished on my behalf, I quickly came to the conclusion that there isn't anything that he hasn't accomplished for me. Before Christ intervened into my life, I was lost, blind, and as Ephesians 2 says, dead in my trespasses and sins, in which I formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Furthermore, I was living in the lusts of my flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and was by nature a child of wrath. In this devastating state, I was separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and a stranger to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Brethren, I grew up attending Sunday school and church, and I had heard a lot about God. I had no doubt that he existed, and no part of me could chalk this world or our existence up to chance or evolution. I had heard that God had sent his son to die for my sins, but I couldn't figure out how that really affected me. I was confused, and I didn't understand God's plan or what really happened on the cross. I was ignorant of my horrible condition and, for the most part, unaware of the enmity that stood between God and me. The best that I could come up with was that if God was loving and I was pretty good, then there was no way that he would send someone like me to hell, but I couldn't be sure. I never would have come to the conclusion that I truly was alienated from God unless God himself revealed that to me. Before God opened my eyes that I might turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, I lived in fear. I purposefully lived at a distance from God for fear of being condemned. I feared that I was on the receiving end of the wrath of God, and rightfully so. I was a friend of the world, and as we all know, friendship with the world is hostility toward God. The thought of Christ coming at any moment was a terrifying thought, as I couldn't say with assurance what would come of that day for me. I thank God that he had mercy on me. He didn't leave me in that condition, but rather delivered me from it. He called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. God gave me understanding. No worldly wisdom that I had could reveal the mysteries of the kingdom of God. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in my heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is something that God has shown me and allowed me to see. Without this being revealed to me, I would still be blind and living in a state of utter confusion. But thanks be to God that he has called me into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. without whom I would have no salvation, no hope, and certainly no way of putting off the deeds of the flesh or escaping this present evil world. Amen. I would currently be condemned under the law and would forever remain that way. But praise God, this certainly is not the case. Amen. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Amen. Through Christ, I've been granted access to God received mercy and the forgiveness of my trespasses, trespasses that I could never forgive myself for, God has. And not only that, he remembers them no more. He has even forgiven the guilt of my sin. He has caused me to be made alive and given me a new heart. I am no longer the person I used to be. In Christ, I am new. Amen. God has allowed me to enter into covenant with him. He has put his laws in my heart and written them on my mind. I have peace with God. I've been freed from the law of sin and death, and I'm now free to draw near to the throne of grace with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. The same throne that I once ran from in fear of, I now, through the blood of Christ, can draw near to with confidence, and there receive mercy and find grace to help in my time of need. Since coming into Christ, I have indeed faced trials and the testing of my faith, my faith, which I know is no an ordinary thing. After all, those who desire to live godly will be persecuted. Since I am now fully assured that what God has promised, he is also able to perform, I am able to cling to the precious promises that he has made. In times of sorrow, I have peace which surpasses all comprehension, because I know that God truly is causing all things to work together for my good. Amen. I know that this earth is destined for destruction, so no matter what might be taken away from me here, or what heartache I may face, God's grace is sufficient, and he really is all that I need. 
I know that he cares for me, and I am confident that regardless of the situation I find myself in, he is more than capable, more than capable of providing for my every need. I know that if I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto me. I am able to look back on my trials with joy and thanksgiving, because I can see that they really have made me stronger. Every trial that I have faced has resulted in me trusting God more. Uh, one small instance of this, I used to uh, have a very hard time leaving my daughter Zoe, even for just an hour, for fear of what might happen to her if I wasn't physically there watching her. Uh, I find that I was trying to protect her from things that I'm not even capable of protecting her from. I know that she has God watching out for her now, and I know that he is much more capable of protecting her than I am. I can now say with confidence that there really is no created thing that can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am confident of this because I know that God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ on my behalf. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him, and Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. He really did do this, and there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I am now accepted in the Beloved, and no longer do I have to try to run away and hide from God. For through the blood of the cross, Christ put to death the enmity and reconciled me to God. I now have peace with God. None of these things could I have accomplished on my own. I needed someone to do it for me. I needed a Savior. Only Jesus Christ could have accomplished this. And praise God, we all know he has. Amen. <laughs> now I can say with Paul that having the first fruits of the Spirit, I groan within myself as I eagerly wait for my adoption as a son, the redemption of my body. The same day that I used to view as the terrible day of the Lord, I now see as the great day of the Lord. I am now able to rejoice in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I am able to do so all because of what he has accomplished on my behalf. <clears throat> Paul said to the Romans in 1.8 that... Uh, First, I thank my God <clears throat> through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. The faith that we've received is precious and it's certainly not silent. <clears throat> Paul said that he said, he, he said, first, I thank my God, so this is what I'd like to do also. I thank God for the opportunity that we have to testify of the grace that we've been given. Mm -hmm. I thank my God for the faithful brethren. I thank my God for the testimony that he's given concerning his son, the record. <clears throat> I thank my God whose faith, for the brethren whose faith is really, it's really is being spoken of throughout the whole world. I thank my God for you all, for him leading, leading us to you. I thank my God for the hope that he's put within me, which is the anchor for my soul, both sure and steadfast. <clears throat> I'd like to start, um, like Sister Kayla, we'll do a timeline sort of approach. And I too, like all of us here, have spent my time in vanity, and the time spent was sufficient. It was by my estimation far too long. I don't even wish to have memories of some of the things that I've, some of the sins that I've committed against my God. Living in sin is never any benefit to anyone the time to give it up is now. I thank my God that he was long-suffering towards me, and he called me out of the world through the gospel. The gospel was good news to me, because through the preaching of the cross, the Spirit was able to convict me of my sin. I could see the manner in life that I was living was contrary to God. I was also given to see that God's love towards me wasn't just a, a warm feeling that he had, but that he loved me enough not to leave me in a present fallen condition and bondage, but to free me from my slavery. Praise God. I was once foolish myself, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending my life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another, but... But when the kindness of God, my Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved me, <clears throat> not on the basis of deeds which I have done in righteousness, 
but according to his mercy, by the washing of, washing of gen, regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on me richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, I would be made an heir according to the hope of eternal life. On October 7, 2009, after about a two and a half to three hour Bible study, uh, I was given to believe by God's grace, I was given to believe the gospel and repent of my sin and be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is all in one night. A few weeks later, by the testimony of Brother Pat and Sister Brandy, <clears throat> I began to see that salvation was very, very real and very present. I'd never heard anyone speak with such confidence about the things of God. <clears throat> I'd grown up in a religious environment and went to years of Sunday school, but never really heard a lot about Jesus. The main thing that was discussed is, if you can forgive my loose language, the church traditions or the traditions of men. <clears throat> there really wasn't a whole lot of talk about salvation or Jesus or God or the Spirit at all. There, and frankly, I, I really wasn't... I wasn't really interested in the traditions. I could see that there wasn't any power in them, which was evidenced by how the people lived, myself included. I could never really justify leaving the passing pleasures of this world for a system that, that, that did not really have any point or power. So I began to philosophize about God, creation, and all this theorizing uh, in my mind. It, it brought me more confusion, and Satan took a firmer grip upon me, and I fell deeper into sin. I was totally lost and utterly confused without God and without hope. See, but through this testimony of Brother Pat and Sister Brandy, I could see that Jesus, there was more to Jesus than I'd heard in the Sunday school classes as a kid. He was more than just a good teacher who did nice things and that had to be murdered on a cross. He is the Son of God who took away the sin of the world. He is the man that did not suffer corruption, but was rather raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Amen. He is the one who's been given power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as God has given him. Amen. He is the one who was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Amen. He is the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That Jesus has a lot of power. And that Jesus doesn't produce dead people. That Jesus makes people alive from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Wherever Jesus is, there is life, and life more abundantly. So as I turned to the Lord, the veil was taken away. Things started to make sense. I could see God for who he is, and I could love him. I tasted and found that the Lord is good. He is altogether lovely. His loving kindness is better than life. I found power to overcome the sin which so easily beset me. And by God's grace, this is still, he's still working this way in me. I can testify that the Son has made me free, and I am free indeed. I'm free to draw near to God, to obtain the essential mercy and grace to help in the time of need. I'm free to worship God in spirit and in truth. I'm free to walk about Zion and go round about her. Right? Uh, <laughs> and unlike Moses, we don't have to come down off this mount. I'm now to free to do exactly what I want to do in Christ Jesus. I'm free to sit at the Lord's table and receive of his fullness grace upon grace. The Lord is still purifying us, though, along with all his people. We are being prepared to stand holy and without blame before him in love. This is what the Lord is currently doing in all of us. I've found that this method of purification is to be refining or, uh, refi or refining as it's in the furnace of afflictions. This kind of purification is not like taking a pleasant bath. Sometimes this is kind of this is how it is, but the bath that it does that method doesn't get the dross out of the silver. It doesn't get deep enough, and the aim of this purification is done 
in the heart. The aim is to try the faith. I've found that the refining of faith to be done through sufferings. And considering the current events, I kind of feel almost inadequate to speak about sufferings before you, brethren. But as uh, Sister Kayla pointed out, that all, all that <clears throat> will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This doesn't make them easy to go through, but we have fellowship in suffering, the same as we have fellowship in believing. Mm -hmm. Kayla and I have recently undergone many changes in our life. We've had to leave family and brethren for the sake of Christ. And this hasn't been easy to do, but in the middle of these trials, we've had great joy and peace in believing through the Spirit, which is quite contrary, <clears throat> quite contrary to the circumstances, and I'm sure that Satan would not have preferred this either. As I reflected on these trials and considered the great paradox of having joy and suffering, I asked myself, what is God showing me? Well, the Savior has been showing me that I can trust in him more fully. And that's the scripture that came to my mind was that the Lord will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It was clear, it was so clear that the reason that I hadn't fallen by the wayside was because God was still with me. It sounds very simple, but when the, it's one thing to have something like this memorized, but it's quite another to connect this scripture with what's going on in your life. Amen. We can button it down, as Brother Al said, and say that the, the spirit was testifying with my spirit. Mm -hmm. yes. this, is what, this is what was going on, and it, it affirmed my, to my heart and made it real. He's also affirmed to me that I've been seated with Christ in heavenly places, a place where Satan cannot get to you. <laughs> He has been cast down. <clears throat> the Lord also affirmed to me that he is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch us out of his hand. Amen. I cried out to the Lord and was delivered, Amen. trusted in him, and was not ashamed. Amen. I've found that I have a love of the truth. I've also found that the word of God is living and active. <clears throat> I'd like to close with some general remarks, some things that I've been able to see about the accomplishments of Christ on our behalf. After scanning the list of texts for this year's renewal, it quickly became evident that these were things that Christ really did complete or accomplish. These things are not suggestions, nor are they hints at what might have been done. These things are real and they are finished. <clears throat> These things were necessary for our salvation and God's eternal purpose. And not a single one of these has been, could have been done on our own or as a group effort. The Lord can show us this. It, he's been showing us this for a long time. It, even in the, in the garden with the fig leaves and, and uh, with the Tower of, of Babel. These things, he's showing us that we cannot do it. <clears throat> Christ did these things that we're talking about, such as satisfying the God of heaven, taking away the sin of the world, delivering us from this evil world, destroying the devil, ending the law as a means to, of righteousness. He did all these things with one appearance. <clears throat> so really what we're talking about is one act and one appearance at a Christ who has been humbled and at his weakest state. <clears throat> all these good things happened then and the good news is that he will appear a second time quickly. And this time, he will not be humbled. He will be exalted, and he will be in all his glory. This time, his reward shall be with him, and we say, come, Lord Jesus. All the accomplishments of Christ are perfectly harmonious with one another. <clears throat> These things are not like merit badges where you can have one and not another. These things were really declaring, like, one act so it's that when you get one of these you have them all these are these were all really accomplished on our behalf <clears throat> they're not somehow disassociated standalone things they're not like a tournament trophy that just sits up on a mantle to gaze upon and never really be used there's real power in these when we've rec when I've when I've been able to reckon upon them I've found power within them they're not an end of themselves. 
Take, for example, Christ delivering us up for uh, delivering us from this present evil world. Excuse me. This had to be done so that we could be seated with Christ in heavenly places, <clears throat> where Christ is, where Satan has no dominion. <clears throat> so it, we can see that they're not an end. These things really did happen. They're true accomplishments. Christ was given a real work to do, and He really completed it. We're actually partaking of these things now. <clears throat> we're eating of his labor, so to speak. These accomplishments, although very real, cannot uh, be seen openly yet. Yet. <clears throat> they must be seen by the eyes of faith. But it will not always be this way, brethren. When Christ returns without sin unto salvation, it will be very, very apparent that he accomplished everything that the Father had given him to do. Amen. It will be very apparent that when Christ died, something happened. And at that time, there will be no more trying the spirits to see whether they're of God. <clears throat> there will be no more death. There will be no more separation. There will be no more sin. No more fighting the good fight of faith. <clears throat> faith will become sight. The children of God, we will receive these treasures that we've laid up for ourselves in heaven. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we will inhabit the body that has been prepared for us, the body like unto Christ's glorious body. We will know as we're fully known. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. We will be like Jesus. The conforming us into his image will be a success. We will be given to sit with Christ on his throne. We will experience the fullness of joy in his presence. We will be received and we will be given a kingdom. I'd like to share with you, I know it's already been read before, but it's safe to say it again. <clears throat> this is the hope or substance thereof, I guess. Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there will be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Thank you, brother.